account. Um, and it, it's really a privilege to be able to allow to to lead this after Steve has been leading this for so many years. Um, and of course, I'm super grateful for the support of Zane, who will be speaking right after me as well. Um, I'll be giving you all uh, a quick background on the CBCs and then uh, roll into our Christmas bird count and discuss some of the things that we've observed over the years and um, hopefully it illustrates why it's so valuable. Um, I know that it's a very mixed audience. Some people will have seen some of these slides before and others uh, are completely new. So this is primarily for those newcomers to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Um, and if you have any questions uh, at the very end, uh, just put them in the chat. Um, <clears throat> the Christmas bird count uh, phenomenon started exactly in the year 1900, Christmas Eve 1900, where it was introduced as a replacement for the Christmas uh, side hunt. People would go out and shoot as many birds as they could kill. Uh, and back then, uh, the idea was launched to, uh, to just count birds. And so that year, there were 25 count circles uh, ranging from uh, Toronto to Ontario, Pacific Grove, California. And 27 birders that year reported 89 species. Um, today, there are over 1,500 count circles throughout the US and over 50,000 people participate. The CBC typically happens a few weeks or a week before Christmas, all the way up to the first week of the new year. Uh, and um, we are one of many in California. So this is the 52nd uh, edition. Um, last year, we finally hope, went back to uh, normal participation numbers. We had 85 people participate last year. Unfortunately, we had a, a dip as most of you know, the year before. Um, and so, yeah, this year we're looking at at least this level of participation, if not more. Um, our count circle, every count circle uh, is 15 miles across, give or take, and centered on a central feature. Uh, in our case, it's uh, the, the middle of the count circle is uh, the Lake Solano Bridge. And, uh, it's subdivided in 10 areas. Um, we're fortunate to have a very uh, prominent feature in the center of our circle, Bobcat Ranch, uh, which is the California Audubon uh, long-term conservation site uh, indicated on the map here in, in, in pink. Uh, and actually uh, it overlaps with uh, three areas. Um, Uh, we have a quite an elevational range in this uh, area from 82 feet at the outlet of uh, Buddha Creek on the northeast side of the count circle all the way up to uh, 2,800 feet uh, in the southwest at Mount Vaca. Um, <clears throat> we've had a very per uh, consistent participation um, in the Buddha Creek uh, count. Uh, the number of party hours has remained very consistent, uh, just below 200 hours uh, per count. And we have seen a steady, a constant number of species, slight increase over the years. Um, and this consistency is super important because it really allows this uh, largest citizen science project in, in, in the world, really, to uh, uh, actually generate information that is useful for, for scientific analysis as well. Um, uh, what's interesting about our area is that it uh, covers a transition, a geomorphologic and biogeographic transition, ecological transition from the uh, alluvial fans in the east, the flat areas with orchards and uh, cottonwood and oak, uh, valley oak streams 
which is largely covered by areas three, five, and six. Um, <clears throat> the Western Valley foothills, the transition just west of Winters, the town of Winters is, is situated right here where I'm sort of pointing at my mouse. Um, transitioning towards the the foothill ridges and valleys uh, dominated by uh, uh, blue oak, chimneys, and uh, uh, chaparral vegetation on the on the ridges. Um, the name <coughs> of the creek uh, of the the county is after uh, the Puda Creek, <laughs> which is the central feature running, as uh, all of you know, straight through the the count circle, going from Lake Berryessa towards uh, towards Davis. Um, today, I observed that uh, Berryessa is, is historically low, and there's very low flows in the creek, so it's going to be very interesting to see what that does to to the count. Um, Talking about citizen science, uh, one of our prominent si citizen scientists, Steve Hampton, uh, just had a paper published on uh, information generated by the Christmas bird count. Um, and one of the interesting things that you can do with such a long record is really start seeing what kinds of uh, changes are, are, are taking place and start speculating about causes uh, some of it is climate change, some of it is habitat change, and some of it is just general uh, uh, e ecology or, or ecological health. Um, and so one of the things that uh, is really stands out is the, the dramatic increase in, uh, in raven and uh, turkey vultures and uh, hummingbirds over the past uh, decades, um, all of which were basically very, very low in presence, if not present at all, until uh, last year where we had yeah, 300 uh, turkey vultures and over 600 uh, raven. So those are, we're looking forward to uh, having uh, uh, a unique, uh, a new high in, in, in raven for this year, for example. Um, Oh, and one thing, so one of the things I, I did with the data this year is I started automating the plotting so I can plot any of these species, uh, any of the species that we've observed uh, during the bird count and uh, can pull out this information kind of on the fly. Um, one of the interesting things we've seen over the past winters is that um, there's an increase in, in wintering insectivores, uh, neotropical migrants, and uh, waterfowl. Um, and today I saw ridiculous numbers of buffalo head on uh, Puda Creek. Um, Golden Eye also showing up uh, in much greater numbers over the past years. And uh, that's likely the result of uh, much milder winters and uh, a greater availability in the case of uh, Western tanager of insects and in the case of uh, Western bluebirds of insects. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Lake Solano, uh, changing uh, slowly uh, to a shallower and uh, kind of environment. Um, so certain bird species are really surging and going up. Um, one of the groups of birds that we've seen a rapid decline in is grassland species, and this is likely related to the conversion of uh, the uh, of grassland uh, to uh, orchards um, and uh, yeah the the biggest drops are in in the American kestrel shrikes uh, western metal larks kite oh, kites all these for the typo and uh, pheasants um, obviously climate change is exerting its uh, influence on uh, on our community on our ecosystem uh, we are getting hotter and warmer summers. Uh, overall, winters are, are milder and warmer. And uh, we've been in a, a multi-year drought now. So uh, this extended, extended drought is, uh, is also leading to uh, what uh, Steve has coined uh, a phenomenon uh, called aerozonification. We're getting more and more uh, uh, a desert climate uh, in, in in our part of the California, and as a result, we also see species that uh, 
that uh, favor that kind of environment and climate. Um, one of the things that I think are always uh, important to think of when we talk about climate change, the current rate of change. When people say, well, climate change has been happening, have been happening, happening over millions of years and we've never, you know, it's, it's a normal thing. If we look at the current rate of change, we are changing so much faster than anything we've seen in, uh, in any of our geological and ecological records. And so it's uh, truly concerning. Um, over the last decades, we've experienced the 10th, 10 largest uh, and 10 most destructive wildfires in, uh, in California history. And uh, just summing up till 2020, not including 2021, um, we see that all these uh, these biggest fires uh, and most intense fires uh, are directly correlated to uh, the average precipitation totals and uh, mean temperatures. So it's it's hotter and drier, and that is clearly the driver behind these major uh, fires. Um, a little bit of fire ecology. Um, so normally we live in a, in, in a part of California that is where, where the ecosystem is fire adapted. Uh, so normally, uh, and actually uh, the ecosystem needs fire uh, to go through certain transitions. You'll have a fire event, ecosystem recovers over time and comes back to its initial state. And then the fire will happen again and again and things will be able, uh, the, the ecosystem is able to recover uh, through time. Um, with increased human presence over the past uh, centuries, uh, we've seen that these recoveries get interrupted. And so fire gets caused by people. And uh, as a result, the recovery takes longer. Now, one of the things that happens uh, and we see increasingly happening is that a tipping point is exceeded and this ecosystem is not able to recover and gets tipped into a, a new state and is uh, completely shifts from a uh, forested ecosystem, for example, to, to grassland. Um, this is an animation of all the fires uh, since the, the 1970s, I believe. Uh, and what we see here is that um, Basically, every year, every decade, there are fires with different extent. But last, uh, in 2020, we experienced something that was much, much larger than we've ever experienced in, uh, in California history. The LNU lightning fire, fire um, resulted in a combined burn area of 363,000 acres. Uh, which was the sixth largest uh, wildfire in California history at the time. And uh, over half of our burn circle, uh, sorry, our count circle got burned. So you can see here in the yellow uh, that, yeah, most of the areas were affected. And you'll still see when you drive out there the, the foundations of the burn homes that uh, were caught in this. Um, and just for reference here, so here's our count circle 15 miles across, and you can just see how, how extensive that burn was. Um, so what does that mean for the bird species? Well, uh, one of the species that really was most affected is the wren tit. Um, their, their numbers collapsed after the, in, in the count circle um, after the fires of uh, 2020. And uh, it's definitely a species to watch this year uh, and see if it if it uh, if it comes back. Um, for those who of you who haven't really heard them before, they have a very distinct call. Might be a bit too quiet, but it has this bouncy ball call. Um, So I hope uh, that uh, we'll hear some of that this year. Um, the rented also, if you look at this really cool new portal that uh, Audubon, uh, National Audubon has put up uh, based on the Christmas bird count data, um, you, you can plot 
the information from these other bird counts as well. And if you look at Western California or the coastal California data, you see uh, a dramatic decline in uh, rentits overall. Um, and if you look at the climate projections that are also featured on uh, a different part of the, the site, you can see that uh, this entire bathtub ring around the Central Valley uh, where these uh, rentits reside uh, is likely to, to lead to a, a, a massive dec decline in habitat and uh, conditions. Now, one of the problems with the data set that I want to point out, so Audubon put this on their website, but their, their polygons are sometimes very large. So here, this polygon extends all the way up to Alaska and shows re the range of rentits uh, and the trend in rentits going up, up there. But uh, in reality, uh, the rented currently does not uh, pass uh, the Columbia River. So um, all of that is kind of erroneous. So that's a, but yeah, they, the, the rentits make it up to, to Portland. Um, they do see an increase in, in rentits up there though. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's a lot of resources that I encourage you to also explore through the Audubon, Audubon uh, National website. You can find information on specific species and these climate projections, but also uh, the CBC website where you can see these climate trends, which is uh, really cool. Um, some other birds that uh, are affected that we have basically lost. There were no observational records of uh, pileated woodpecker early in the in the counts. Then they started uh, showing up in our area and really uh, taking over. Well, I mean, we'd see five to 10 each year. And then as of last year, uh, nobody has seen a pileated woodpecker in Yolo County uh, at all. I don't think in this part of uh, Solano County we've had any either. Uh, and that's entirely due to the fires. They need um, old growth. Uh, uh, pine and oak, and uh, yeah, they are overall uh, disappearing um, in uh, in our part. Um, another bird uh, that we're looking forward to seeing in greater numbers this year again is uh, our California threshers and and fox sparrows throughout the valley. Uh, there's definitely a strong showing of fox sparrows this year, so uh, we'll see what 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 happens. Uh, uh, at this count. Um, California treasures were also quite affected. They're chaparral species. They like to live on that transition to higher parts. And so uh, we'll see if they can uh, they can come back. Um, one thing to point out, apologies for going back. The, the reason that the, the rented was so affected is that the rented typically ranges maybe one or two acres in its lifespan. It doesn't really leave its spot. And so when they're burned, they don't migrate back in. They're very sedentary. Um, uh, Pileated woodpeckers are also very sedentary. They don't migrate um, as well as uh, California treasures. So those are uh, species that, that are more affected. Um, there's also some... Uh, success stories. Uh, well, the Kenyan wren is dropping and we haven't seen many of those. We'll hopefully get some again. Rock wrens are the first recruiters after fire. So we actually see those come back much quicker. They don't uh, seem to be, they, they are affected by the fires, but they also come back much quicker. Um, pygmy owls have been severely affected. We, we don't really have uh, any uh, great numbers of, of pygmy owls on the last counts. And so we'll look for those uh, as well as screech owls. Um, again, they are very distinct, uh, very easy to recognize. Once you hear them, you uh, won't see them as often. So it's a pygmy owl. And another. Excuse me, Bart. Is anyone hearing the uh, the sounds? 
It doesn't go through. Oh, mean. Oh, well, let me, let me ignore that then. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that, Ken. Um, oh, man. I, I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. Uh, uh, just, just fake it. Go, ooh, ooh, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, a, uh, a pick me all goes, ooh, what is it? And uh, a screech owl does sort of a bouncy ball. Do, 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 Some do, people do. are hearing it. I'm sorry, Bart. Some, Some people are hearing it. Oh, okay. Okay, so so it's not it's not a, a you're, you're doing good. Uh, okay. It's faint, well, so I don't know how you work on the volume on your end. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do. Okay, it. okay, fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I hope I didn't butcher that too much. Um, <laughs> And then there's some birds that really need fire. So that's an interesting thing as well. Last summer and spring, we saw inc incredible numbers of lazuli buntings up on the ridges, um, especially up above Mix Canyon and, uh, and uh, Gates Canyon, as well as bell sparrow that typically uh, show up in areas four, five, six years after a burn. So if that, uh, yeah, if all goes well, those will be. Um, Bell sparrows will be present in, in great numbers. Leslie buntings have left already, but uh, they, yeah, those are two major um, uh, post fire colonizers. So uh, I hope this showed a bit in a nutshell uh, how our citizen science efforts uh, support uh, bird conservation and uh, science uh, that's being led by Audubon. Um, and I hope that we'll find some of these species and, uh, and, and you'll be on the lookout for, for those. Um, as you know, this Sunday will be the count and um, we still have uh, a few spots available. So if you are uh, unassigned yet, please contact me and I can put you in touch with uh, area leaders. Um, there's quite some variation in, uh, in difficulty level of, uh, of uh, basically passing through the terrain. As you can see, obviously the west side of the mountains is, uh, is, uh, is, is more rough terrain. We do have some spots in area one and area two for uh, those who can hike well. Um, for those who, uh, and I guess it, it's a mixed bag for Bobcat Ranch for the east side here. We also have some spots there as well. Um, if there's any other areas uh, or if there's any other constraints, let me know. I can try to place you in an in area. Oh, I see that area seven, the label dropped off, but area seven down here uh, may be able to accommodate a bit more as well. So please reach out to me and uh, and I'll get you uh, get you placed. Um, are there any questions? Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave a break here for a second. Um, Let's see. Right. Let's see the question. Should, oh. Oh, Virginia. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll put my email here in the text uh, chat. Uh, please uh, contact me there. Um, yeah, sorry about the sound. <laughs> Bart, that uh, went directly to me. I will. I will oh, <laughs> you can I'm, I'm not it. sure I can get it out to everyone, but I'll try. Yeah, I'm all over the place today. Uh, I see. I, I can do it, Bart. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, please go ahead and type them. Uh, if not, um, we'll make Zane the presenter who will give us uh, an introduction to bird identification and uh, uh, some really interesting uh, bird identification challenges. Uh, Bart, do you want me to go share my screen? So I can yeah, just go through it. I think Ken needs to make you the- He's I good. Think... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um... I know. Oh, so the logistics for today, Katie. Um, so in general, 
the area leaders will let you know how they approach their their count. Uh, in general, people meet around 8 a.m. and bird throughout the day uh, till two or three, typically, some areas a bit longer. Um, and then by five, uh, we all go back and it's, what was it, six o'clock, uh, the potluck uh, starts at, uh, at the senior center. It will open a little earlier than that, especially if it's cold and wet. Okay, you, yeah, I guess you can trickle in. Uh, um, um Oh, uh, the last of the buntings, which you won't see, <laughs> just showed them because they were so 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 uh, present this this summer. They were really on the ridges, uh, up well throughout the area, but they 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 nest. Um, Higher up uh, in in Mix Canyon um, and uh, Gates Canyon, so in in Chaparral kind of, uh, kind of uh, vegetation. All right, you ready to take it away, Zane? Um, yeah, my computer's not letting me share. Can you pull up the presentation again from your end? Should I just uh, show it? Yeah, how about that? That'd be better. Thank you. Okay. So were you having a hard time sharing uh, what Zane? Uh yeah, I think uh something's going on with Zoom. It's not it's not uh your issue. It's on my end. So we'll just go like this. It's all good. Oh okay. Okay. Uh, um anyway, yeah. I was gonna take you guys through some common uh difficult identifications you might come across while out birding on the Christmas bird count. Um, this is a tradition that I think Steve Hampton started maybe 20 years ago, the bird ID workshop. Um, Emmett Iverson, a lot of you probably know him, loved this last year and I took what he had and kind of tried to make it my own a little bit. So here we go. Um, Bart, thanks. So yeah, I just wanted to start off um, with a quick overview. Uh, we'll talk about habitat and how that influences how you identify a bird and we'll look at some range maps and see how that can help you to narrow down a species. Um, I find bird anatomy and using the correct uh, terminology of bird anatomy to be really beneficial when you're describing a bird. It helps you come across as um, like, you know what you're talking about, right? You want people to like hear you describe a bird and be like, wow, okay. They really were specific and accurate. Um, I made a little checklist that you can follow when you're making an, an identification, and then we're going to run through some bird IDs that you'll probably come across on the count. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is habitat. Um, it's a really good clue and can really help you narrow down between maybe if you have two species that look sim similar superficially, but you aren't quite sure. So the example I picked was a song sparrow up on top there and below it is a fox sparrow. So they look really similar, right? But let's say you come across a bird and you aren't sure what it is. And for example, if it's a fox sparrow, it might be up, up at Mount Vaca where it's a little bit higher. There's a lot of chemise and chaparral and you aren't really gonna find a song sparrow up there, but you will find fox sparrows. And so if you see one of these two species in that habitat, it's a pretty good clue that you probably are looking at a fox sparrow. Um, go ahead. So the Puda Creek CBC, that's a big circle. Bart was talking about the map aspect of it. And there's a lot of different habitats included. So um, one is riparian. You find that along Puda Creek. You're thinking like blackberries, tall cottonwoods, valley oaks, big trees, really lush habitat. Um, by contrast, chaparral is a little bit higher up. You're going to find it on the ridges. Um, like area eight and area um, yeah, nine and 10 have a lot of chemise and toyon and a lot of it's burned now, but it's coming back and you'll see thrashers and rentits and those species in the chaparral. Um, areas two and parts of area three, as well as area one have a lot of grasslands and oaked woodland. Um, 
So it'll kind of vary depending on the elevation and the location, but you'll see a lot of blue oak and gray pine, short grasses, a lot of meadow larks and acorn woodpeckers use that ha habitat. Um, I lead area six, which is in the middle. Um, area five is very similar. And that has a lot of orchards and um, agricultural fields, as well as a lot of residential like homes and um, ponds with ornamental trees. A lot of fruiting trees that people have planted that'll bring in unusual birds sometimes. Sparrows love it. Um, and the orchards will have bluebirds and house finches. And then Berryessa is the cliche body of water in this area, but there's lots of ponds throughout the circle and we'll be looking for ducks and all kinds of different birds in there. Um, time of year can really play a big role in a, when you're identifying a bird. So using range maps and a field guide is a big help. So let's say you came across this bird in this photo and you weren't sure what it was. You might go to the next slide here and check your field guide. And I just pulled this right from Sibley. So you know that you're looking at a thrush and you're like, hmm, it's got a spotted breast, it's got an eye ring. You aren't really sure exactly whether it's a Swainson's thrush or a hermit thrush and you're not sure what to do. So then you check your range maps on the next slide. And you can see that Swainson's thrushes aren't here in the winter. They're all the way down in South America where it's blue. Oh, one back. And hermit thrushes are. So on these range maps, they're really helpful. Generally warmer colors like oranges and yellows typically indicate breeding range. In this case, the orange is breeding. And softer colors like blues or maybe purples will represent winter ranges and the middle usually represent like a migratory corridor. So in the case of the Swainson's thrush, they breed up north in Canada, migrate through the United States and winter in South America. So using these range maps, you could pretty easily determine that you're most likely looking at a hermit thrush at this time of year. I find bird anatomy to be really interesting, really complicated sometimes, but um, it's beneficial to use the correct terminology when describing what you've seen. Um, this diagram right here is pretty straightforward. It talks about the main parts of a little songbird. Um, and we'll get into this more when we make some identifications in a bit. Uh, next one. And anatomy can get really specific, really complicated. Um, most field guides have diagrams. This is straight from Sibley, um, which is my favorite. And it does a great job of breaking down feather groups and different parts of the bird. So again, we'll talk more about that in a bit. So bird descriptions are really important. Um, you might come across a bird you've never seen or maybe a rare bird for the count or just when you're out birding in general. And it's really important to have a complete and thorough description of what you saw. And that can include a lot of different things. So one of the things you should focus on is the behavior. It might be running on the ground like, like a thrasher or wagging its tail like a pipit. Warblers and vireos glean insects from tree leaves. Um, you wanna think about posture. Um, we'll talk about that in some examples later, but some birds are really hunched over and while others tend to sit up really straight. Shape and size are important. They can be tough to judge depending on distance and lighting, but using other species that you're familiar with as like a baseline can be really helpful. Um, you'll talk about color and plumage details, especially contrast and describe things like the bill, the legs the, and the tail. Um, you might surmise what it eats based on the type of bill it has. Maybe it has a thick bill for eating seeds or a thinner bill for gleaning insects. Doing your best to describe vocalizations is really helpful. Um, sometimes if you can come up with words to describe it uh, or even like imitating it. So people have told me before that golden crown sparrows, when they sing, they say, oh dear me. And I won't forget what they sound like now. And then just more generally, if you can narrow it down to a family like a duck a shorebird or a warbler can also be really helpful. Go ahead. Um, this is an example of oak woodland habitat. These are blue oaks in area three. And so now I wanna go through some common identification challenges and we'll start right off 
with female house finch versus purple finch. These are really tricky. Um, took me a long time to get familiar with this, but some of the things you wanna look for in general is house finches have really dense streaking on their underparts. And as a result, they look a lot browner overall. The purple finch there on the right looks a lot paler just as a result of uh, having wider underparts with less streaking. Um, you'll look at the face and note that house finches have a really plain face, whereas the purple finch has a really bold supercilium or eyebrow. So it's that white line that Bart's pointing out right there. Um, you can look at the wings and note that house finches have a pretty nondescript wing panel. They don't really have any wing bars or any fancy striping or anything like that. But purple finches typically have two little wing bars that stick out, especially in good light. And the last thing that's hard to see without a good look, but these pictures show it pretty well, is the Coleman, which is the bend of the bill where the upper and lower mandibles meet. And house finch, it's curved. So Bart's pointing that out right there. There's a little curve in the bill, whereas that little notch in um, the purple finch is completely straight and they have a very triangular bill. And we'll move on and look at the males, which are also complicated. A little bit more straightforward, just generally, the house finch males have bright strawberry red. That's pretty much limited to the head and breast with, with a lot of brown streaking on the sides and the flanks, just below the folded wing. Um, general structure like the Coleman and the head is consistent with the females. And on purple finch, they also have that supercilium, right? That little eyebrow. It's not white in males, it's actually pink, but it still is pretty contrasty compared to the dark red head. And we'll go ahead and look at some blackbirds next. Um, this is a tough one, and you gotta see these things pretty well. But brown headed cowbird and Brewer's blackbird females can be told apart mostly by the pale face of the brown headed cowbird. They have a little beady eye that sticks out as a result of their head being paler. Uh, Brown-headed cowbirds have a thick bill, um, almost more like a sparrow in shape, and they have a white throat. On the other hand, Brewer's blackbirds have a thinner bill. It's a little bit curved, and their whole body is pretty evenly black to brown. They don't really have any distinctive markings, no white throat, no paler face. It's pretty even overall. Um, but shape is big, especially the bill. If you can see that, you'll know you're looking at a cowbird or a blackbird. A couple more tricky blackbirds. When we're looking at some male tricolor blackbirds and red wing blackbirds. Um, you can get pretty specific here and look at the coverts on both these birds. If you look at the tricolor blackbird on the right, they have dark red lesser coverts. And right below, the median coverts are off white. Um, in flight, this means that the shoulder patch actually looks a little bit bigger than on red wing blackbird, which have black, um, lesser, or sorry, median coverts. Um, and another thing that's interesting is in good light, tricolored blackbirds are very glossy. They kind of are almost iridescent. And so the sun will sh shine off them. Red winged blackbirds are more of a matte black. Um, they'll be like even colored throughout and you don't really get that glossy sheen that you see on tricolored blackbirds. This is a fun one. I always thought that these would be really hard to tell apart when I first started looking in my field guides. And then I started going out and seeing them in person and I realized they're not as close as they look superficially. Um, Hutton's vireos and ruby crown kinglets are Honestly, they're just bit, like structurally really different. Hutton's vireos are a little bit bigger. Um, they have a big head that kind of just fits with the body. They don't really have much of a neck or anything. They're very compact. Um, their bill is really thick and has a tiny little curve at the tip, which is consistent with all vireos. Um, a key thing to point out is the wing on Hutton's vireo. The edging of the secondaries, which is um, yellow, goes up right behind the second wing bar. So Bart's pointing that out right there. Those are the secondaries right in there. And 
it's yellow and it goes right up to the second wing bar. If you look on the other side on Kinglet, the secondary stop and there's a black bar right behind the second white wing bar. That black bar is present in Kinglet in all plumages and is diagnostic between Kinglet and Hutton's Vireo. Um, other things to note on the Kinglet are the smaller bill um, and the dark legs that typically have a little bit paler, more flesh colored feet. And another thing to note is when it's for when these birds are foraging, kinglets, as many of you are probably familiar with, are really frantic. They'll sometimes even hover in place while they pick off insects from, from underneath a leaf. On the other hand, Putton's vireos are really slow moving. They're a bigger bird and they're very methodical. They'll just kind of walk around and casually pick off a, a worm or something off of a leaf. And so they're typically a lot more slow moving. This is a fun one too, downy woodpecker and hairy woodpecker. Um, this photo I really like, it does a great job of showing the differences between the species. First of all, hairy woodpecker is a much larger bird. Um, and with that comes a much bigger bill. Um, probably almost twice the size of that downy woodpecker's bill on the left. Um, and it's just a, it's a bulkier bird. Uh, if you, if you have doubt, you're probably looking at a, a downy woodpecker. Harry's are even bigger than acorn woodpeckers for reference. Well, downy are really small, uh, smaller than nut owls even. Um, another thing to note is that this photo was taken back east and the birds that we see are a lot browner overall. Um, the Pacific population tends to be a lot browner. Um, looking at some non-breeding goldfinches is fun. Um, a key thing here to look at is the wings. On American goldfinch on the right, it has two really bold wing bars, um, kind of a off-white wing bar on an otherwise really dark wing panel. So those wing bars really pop. Whereas on lesser goldfinch on the left, it's kind of messy. There's a couple of wing bars. There's some edging on the secondaries. Um, nothing really like super obvious. Um, American goldfinches also tend to be a lot browner overall, especially in the winter, like we're gonna be seeing them this weekend. Lesser goldfinches throughout the year, the females and immatures are kind of an even olive green. Um, looking at the wing pattern, is also really helpful in flight. Um, American goldfinches have a really black wing with just a couple of thin wing bars that you don't necessarily really notice, but lesser goldfinches have these diagnostic white wing patches that are really thick and can be seen from above and below. And when you see them flying, you'll, you'll just see flashes of black and white in their wings and it's really, really bold. Um, other finches like evening grosbeaks have the same white patch but we don't have evening gross peaks and on this count and it's the only North American goldfinch to have this wing pattern. I get asked a lot about sharp shinned hawk and Cooper's hawk. Um, this, these photos do a really nice job of showing the differences. Sharp shinned hawks have a really hunched posture. We talked about that earlier. Um, it almost looks like they have no neck. Their head just kind of sits between the shoulders and it's really compact. Um, they have a smaller head and bill, which is consistent with the, being the smaller bird. And even in that photo, you can see the tail is really squared off. Um, on the right is the Cooper's hawk, much bigger occipiter. Um, the tail is curved. You can kind of kind of make that out. We'll see it more on the next slide. Um, but the head extends a lot more from the body. It has more of a neck. Um, it's a bigger bill, bigger head. and the key is really just the, the structure, the almost like the head protruding from the body a little bit. And we'll see that in the flight shot in the next slide. Let me grab a little more water. Um, here we can really see the differences in shape and structure and flight. The sharp shinned hawk on the left has a completely squared off tail, it makes like a really flat tip of the tail. And I like to say that it's square on Sharpie. Um, whereas on the other hand, those tail feathers make a curve on the coopers. And I say it's a C for coopers. 
um, that helps me to remember that. And another thing to note is because of the shorter hunched posture that we saw on the perch sharpshin talk, um, you can compare it in flight. The head this is about the same distance away from the body as the leading edge of the wing where it bends. So you can kind of like draw a line from the, the front tip of the, the wing um, to the head. Whereas on Cooper's hawk, the head protrudes from the body and it is well beyond the leading edge of the wing. Yeah, Bart's showing it well right there. I found this online and I really like this diagram uh, between immature bald eagles and golden eagles. Um, it does a good job of describing the differences right there, but on bald eagle on the right, underneath the wing, it's really white and mottled. It's kind of, it can vary a lot. That's one example. Um, the tail is also mottled brown and white and black. And it's kind of just like inconsistent depending on the different birds, but there's no real definition to the white patches. Whereas on golden eagle on the left there, there's a really clear definition between the white base of the tail and the black outer half of the tail. And it has two white wing patches way out on the end of the wing there. Um, similar concept to the lesser goldfinch actually from a couple slides ago. Uh, if you see those well-defined kind of contained white patches, it's a good chance you're looking at a golden eagle and not a bald. So Vesper sparrows have really declined in the count circle. We'll be lucky to see any this year, but Savannah sparrows are all over the place and I'm sure we'll see plenty. Um, but telling them apart really comes down to some fine patterns in the Vesper sparrows face. So the auriculars, the area right around the eye and below it are bordered in Vesper sparrow by a dark J. So you can just kind of make that out in that photo. There's a dark little J right there that Bart's showing. Um, as well as a well-defined white eye ring. Um, Vesper sparrows also have a tiny little patch of rufus on the lesser cover. So you can just see it right there where the shoulder is in that photo. Um, yep, right there. As well as white outer retrices or the tail feathers, also just barely showing in that photo. If you see a small sparrow that you think is a savanna or a Vesper in flight, if it's flashing white like that, it's a good chance it's a Vesper. On the other hand, savanna sparrows have a much different kind of softer face pattern. They even have a little bit of yellow in the lowers between the eye and the bill. And um, they're, the pattern on the face is a lot less defined. It can vary a little bit. There's no real outline to the auriculars. Um, the pale on the auricular just kind of meshes with the rest of the face. Um, they're really densely streaked on the underparts. Um, whereas Vesper Sparrow tend to be a little bit cleaner white on the belly. And um, they look really short tailed in flight. I, I don't know if that's just something I've noticed, but um, Vesper Sparrow seem to be a little bit longer tailed than the ones I've seen. So this is one that gets um, mistaken a lot. And I think uh, band tailed pigeons sometimes get over reported on this count as a result, but. Eurasian collared doves and band-tailed pigeons can be told apart pretty straightforward just by how pale collared doves tend to be in flight. And that can change a lot with lighting. So another thing to look at is the tail pattern. And on collared dove on the left, they have a black base of the tail and the whole outer half is white. And there's just two colors in the tail. It's just black and then white. Whereas in band-tailed pigeon on the right there, they have a gray base of the tail a dark band and then kind of a darker white tip of the tail. So it's three colors, three bands on the tail as opposed to two. And we can also look at the upper wing, which is also really helpful in telling these apart. Um, on collar dove, the primaries are dark brown, but that dark brown is just limited to the primaries. Right above that on the coverts, they're pale off white. So the dark brown is limited to the edge of the wing, whereas on band-tailed pigeon on the right, the black primaries also extend into the cover. So it kind of makes a little triangle right there that I think Bart's going to outline. Yep, right there. So there on the coverts on band-tailed pigeon is black or dark, and on colored dove, it's really light. 
Obviously, the band-tailed pigeon has a white collar, whereas the collar dove is black. And the band-tailed pigeon has a pretty noticeable yellow bill. Looking at crows and ravens is important, especially this year, as we are predicting a record count of common ravens this, this count. Um, ravens have really exploded in the Central Valley, and it's very likely we'll see a lot of them. So being able to tell them apart in flight is really important. Um, crows are smaller in general and smaller build, but in flight, the best thing to go off of is the tail. Crows have a squared off tail, similar concept to the sharp shin versus Cooper sock. It's, it's squared off in crow, whereas in raven, they have a fan shaped tail. That image in the bottom right does a nice job of showing that kind of like if you would hold a fan and fan yourself the middle of the tail sticks out further than the rest of it. Um, Gold and I have made a really big uh, jump this last couple of years as Puda Creek has gotten shallower in Lake Solano. And so barrows have actually declined, I think, as a result of this, but common have really exploded. Um, and telling apart males and females really comes down to the pattern and the edge of the folded wing. Uh, common on the left have a lot wider, um, just like white with black stripes. And barrows on the right have a black edge of the folded wing with even a little black spur that sticks down into the flanks right there on the corner. That part's got it. Um, head shape is important as well. Common golden eyes have a peaked head. Um, it peaks right above the eye. And barrows, it's more rounded, almost a little bit more of a square or oval shape. And finally, probably most obvious to everybody is the shape of the white patch on the face. Barrows have a nice little crescent that curves up in front of the eye. And common golden eye have a circular white patch at the base of the bill. And females can be even more tricky. Um, you're really going on head shape for the most part with this one. In these photos, you can compare the color of the bill. Common golden eye have generally have a darker bill. It's a, it's a longer bill, um, but the amount of orange in common golden eye can vary a little bit. Barrows are always entirely bright orange on the bill with rare exceptions and immatures. Um, but really it's the head shape that you wanna look at. And this, these photos, you can see the peak above the eye on common golden eye and um, Barrow's golden eye have that kind of blocky square head shape that even kind of sticks out into a point in the back, um, in the back of the head. And so really, if you aren't sure that you're looking at a Barrow's, you're probably looking at a common golden eye on this count. And that's mostly just because Barrow's have declined and they need really fast moving deep water. Whereas common golden eye can be found in the canals or in Lake Solano where it's shallower. So those are a good two to get familiar with. And I wanted to compare the calls of flicker and pileated woodpecker. As Bart mentioned, pileated woodpecker have pretty much been extirpated from the Poudre Creek count circle, but I'm sure someday they'll return. So we should be ready for when that happens. Um, the calls of these two woodpeckers are really, really similar um, and definitely get mistaken a lot. So Bart, if you can click on the Macaulay link on the left there. Yep, for Flickr. And go ahead and play that. Hopefully we can hear it. Uh, I cannot. Can you can you turn it up a little bit, Bart? Well, does that work? Can we give that a try? Bart's still muted. Oh, that, that's the solution, I think. Bart, can you unmute for us? That might help. All right, let me try again. Heard it for a second. All right, well. Did you hear I it? I can actually, no, I couldn't, but I think I can post these links in the chat real quick. Yeah, let's um, do it. But, or at the end, I can do that either way. Um, for the time being, let's just finish this up. If you guys get a chance to listen to Flickr and Pileated Woodpecker recordings, I would highly recommend it. Um, Flickr tends to be a little bit faster 
and higher pitched, whereas Pileated Woodpecker um, averages slower, a longer series of call notes. Um, and they sound more like a whoop, like a really deep, low, husky call, not like the kind of raspy, fast paced call of a flicker. And then finally, a little public service announcement for everybody. Um, it's been noted by a lot of birders in the area that white throated sparrows are having a really impressive winter. Um, these are a species some of you might be familiar with from the East Coast. We typically have golden crowned and white crowned, but white throats are around and some years for whatever reason are better than others. Um, they seem to be all over the place this year. So keep an eye out for those uh, yellow lures between the bill and the eye, that white throat, um, well-distinguished head pattern. And another thing to look for is the uh, white throat sparrows have a much redder back than other uh, zonotrichia sparrows, so white crown and golden crown. Um, most of the time when I pick out white throat sparrows, it's because of that back pattern. So take a look at those sparrow flocks and you might see a white throat sparrow. Uh, Zane, uh, going yep. back to white throat sparrow, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no worries. What about, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, tan versus white in the crown? It's a good question. Yeah, white throat sparrows have two morphs. Um, they have a tan stripe morph and a white stripe morph. Best I can tell, these both, at least the one on the left looks like a white stripe. The one on the right, I think, might be affected by the lighting. Um, so, yeah, they can vary. The color of the stripes can either be tan or white. Um, so, yeah, that, don't let that deter you from calling a white throat sparrow. Yeah, I don't. I don't know as much about that as I should. I need to read more about it. Yeah, I I know that the tan that was in my yard this year, the the yellow lures uh, were were kind of smudgy. Yeah, um, that's yeah. definitely true. I've noticed that in the past. Yeah, we're, we're smudgy, think... and and the the tan. If you look at the picture on the left, at the rear of the the white stripe, where it's kind of off mm -hmm. off white right there. Yep, that's kind of like the whole. Uh, area. Uh, yeah, that's on right. Tan, on the tan I've seen. So yeah, exactly. It's just yeah, when you see that, uh, you, you know it's going to look almost like a, a white throat. But a, a careful look, and as a white throat, as Zane mentioned, the bill is darker in the white throated than it is in the white in the white crown. So yeah, that's true. That's a good. Yeah. That's a good find if you can find one. Got to look at those white crowns. Yeah, Thanks, keep an eye out for sure. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, and like Ken said, the bill is another thing that I forgot to mention. White throated sparrows have that dark gray bill, while um, white crowns have typically an orange bill, and yeah. go golden crown is more of like a dirty yellow color. Yeah, and if you're really familiar with white crowns, it will just jump out at you the difference. Yeah, absolutely. And then you do and your I happy think... dance. <laughs> yep, they're awesome. I think that about wraps it up. Can I see okay. that's the last one, Bart? So it, cool. looking into the chat for questions, yep. uh, I was it seems that. like, oh, there's this really guy who really can't get it done right. He's asked some questions, Zane, uh, on occipiters. Yeah. Uh, is the difference in the color of the nape a reliable field mark? Oof. Um, that's not something I've ever heard of, to be honest with uh, you. In, that doesn't in your mean pictures you had, uh, the... Dark color of, on the sharp shin, the dark color of the uh, crown extends all down the nape to the back. It is reliable in adults. It's a reliable That's in okay, adults. Cool. Yes, yes. Okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. Go. I learned something. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, all right. On the other one, if you can't see the bill or wing bars and a kinglet and vireo, is the eye ring a good field mark? Um, yeah, I think that Hutton's Vireos don't have the most obvious spectacles, so I I don't necessarily go off that. But Hutton's right. Vireos do okay. have pale do have pale lures. I think I noted that yeah on the slide there. So between the eye and the bill is pale in Hutton's Vireo. Typically, it's dark in Ruby Crown Kinglet, but I think there's some variation in that. I I have seen some Hutton's where. You know, uh, I'm looking at the bill, and I'm sort of I'm certain about the the, the the identification because of the bill and the wing bars. 
but yeah, that spectacle thing there, it's just almost was uh, non-existent. Yeah, so I think like there's a lot of variation for whatever yeah, reason. So yeah, so it's, so it's it's not something we should rely on like we can with other variables. Okay. Yep, that's what I excellent. Would go with. Excellent. Uh, let's see. I think that's about it from what I see. There is uh, uh, Nicole. We'll we'll wait till we're finished tonight. Um, I think and the question is, can we uh, mention the the new count circle, Woodland Davis, uh, happening on the 28th. Um, and I, I, Anne might know more about it than I do. Um, so Anne, if you want to chime in on that, when we're done with Zane, Zane, anything else? Any other questions for Zane or, or Bart? Come on, folks. <laughs> no, more basically that means you guys uh, did a great job. I mean, I know you did a great job, but if, if people, you know, they, they were able to understand what you were saying, and that's great. Kudos to both of you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank, thank you. you both. Um, Zane, Zane is our most junior uh, Ottoman boy. <laughs> he, he's, he's amazing. He is. He's incredible. What is so? Um, and thanks. So I, I'm. Uh, I'm happy to say something about the new <clears throat> the new count. It's being headed by <clears throat> Bruce Christensen. He's a board member at um, Hash Creek Conservancy. And I don't have his contact information handy, but you can certainly call Hash Creek Conservancy and, and get it. It is on the 28th. And I know they're, they're looking for uh, more counters. Uh, I think they're set for area leaders, but... Uh, I'm sure uh, Bruce would love to hear from you. Yeah, and just to point out, there are many other count circles right around us. There's, it's, it's, <laughs> you can bird all month if you want in different counts. Okay. Um, the Sacramento bird count is the day after, is Boxing Day day after Christmas. Um, Staten Island is January second, right, Zane? Uh, I think Staten Island overlaps with us. I think it's the 18th. Oh, the eight, oh, sorry, that's the 18th. Yeah. yeah. No, um, it's, uh, Sher Sherman, Sherman Island, Island is the second. Yeah. Island. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there's there's circles all around. There's actually, I can we can share a link to a, a map. Uh, Audubon has on their website a lot of information about all the count circles. And yeah, if you want it, you could bird all month. So yeah. it, there we is a, a site, um, Nature Alley. ALI. Uh, she tries to put together all of the counts in, in, the, in the valley on her website. I, I don't know the, the, I've never been there, so I don't know what the information looks like, but that's one to search. Uh, Nicole did put uh, Bruce's uh, email in the chat, and so did Kurt. So um, what I do know is that the chat will cover a lot of uh, Western. Yeah, far western woodland, some parts of Davis um, to almost approaching the circle, to almost approaching winters. Uh, so, yeah, if they still need help, then if you would like to do another count, uh, taking what you learned today and applying it somewhere else, then uh, get Bruce's uh, information out of the chat and give him a holler. I get it yeah, hold on. Let me very quickly share my screen. So Esri, if you Google Esri C Audubon CBC, you can see all the count circles there are in the world, in North America, uh, and you can zoom in. And um, here we are um, with contact information, date, and um, goes for every count. So. Uh, Sacramento, um, Cosumnes is still open. Andy just sent out an email. They're looking for counters in the Rio Cosumnes count, which is a really interesting place because a lot of the land there is uh, usually not accessible throughout the year. Um, yeah, so look around. There are many, many, many uh, count circles uh, nearby. 
So, uh, okay. Is that map, Bart, uh, available at the on Autobot, National Autobot site? Uh, I think or is so. Is that one you put together? No, 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 no. This is done by Audubon, and I will put that in the chat as well, of course. There we go. And uh, if you Google Audubon CBC, they have a really great landing page with all the background information. And you can also uh, download the data that we've been collecting from there. So you can actually, uh, if you ever wanted more information, more data, let me know. I can guide you or, yeah, there's a lot out there. Okay. Uh, anything else, folks? And no, Martin, I just say. want to uh, thank everyone for coming tonight, and especially our presenters. And uh, uh, hope I'll see a lot of you on Sunday, starting at five at the uh, senior center. Good times. Thanks you mean again. at the compilation? <laughs> what did yeah. I say? Okay. You said Sunday at five, and I'll be I'll be sleeping at five. Compilation. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. All right, folks. Thank you again for organizing everything. You bet. Thank you. Thank you Appreciate for coming tonight. Have a great rest of your evening. See you on Sunday. Oh, uh, gotta remember.